I'd worked there for two years and loved it. There were all kinds of deals and discounts for employees, and we had a big popcorn machine like you see in the movie theaters, free for anyone who wanted a bag. We had a large repeat customer base of regulars that always looked for recommendations, which we were thrilled to give. Two of us would close up at the end of the night, with one typically being a guy. Yet somehow on that Sunday, it ended up being two girls. I was pretty tired from a bad night of sleep and not feeling real great, so I was just trying to get to the end of the shift. My coworker Michelle's boyfriend came by about an hour before closing and went through the aisles repeatedly trying to kill time. Finally, I told her she could take off and I'd close up by myself. It was a Sunday, so we'd be closing at 8, which was half an hour away, and the store had been quiet all day, so I wasn't expecting a big rush. A few minutes after they left, I decided to start cleaning up, which meant going around and collecting the garbage bags from all the bins around the store. The store itself was huge, with dozens of five-foot-high rows of VHS tapes and a large load-bearing pillar decorated with prop characters. There were TVs playing new releases of all kinds. As I walked out from behind the desk to start with the garbage bins, I heard the familiar ding sound come from the front door. It seemed we had a late customer. I went back behind the desk and put another VHS in the automatic tape rewinder. Those things were great. As the tape rewound, I tried to get a better look at who had come in, but they'd turned down the first aisle. Horror and the shelves and one of the large pillars blocked my view. I waited for them to move out from behind the pillar, but they stayed there. Then the tape popped up in the rewinder, and I let out an embarrassing gasp. I kind of winced at myself as I replaced the tape in the plastic sleeve. I set another tape to rewind and decided to start collecting the garbage near the front. When I got up to the horror aisle, the customer was gone. The store was quiet, I walked down the aisle and turned to the right where I could see down two more rows. There was no one. I went down another row and walked out to the main aisle leading to the desk and came face to face with the customer. He was a man in his mid-twenties, about six feet tall. He had long jet black hair and was dressed all in black. He had on a dirty leather jacket and wore chains with pentagrams and goat skulls. The Satanist look wasn't exactly intimidating back then, as it kind of blended in with the punk crowd in the area. I couldn't tell which side this guy was on, but there was something behind his eyes that made me feel cold. He stared at me, long and hard. It was the most uncomfortable I'd ever been. Neither of us spoke, and for a moment, I thought he was going to rush me. Then the tape rewinder popped up and killed the tension. I let out a nervous laugh, and he smiled at me like he'd known me my whole life. Good evening, he said, and walked past me. I croaked out, you too, as I heard the front door open and close in that familiar jingle. I turned and saw the man outside, walking off towards his car at the far end of the parking lot. It was a quarter to eight, so I decided to shut the store down early. The man left a lasting impression, and I called my boyfriend and told him to be there at 8 to pick me up. I locked the front door and felt a lot better. I picked up all the garbage and put it away. Then I went back to the front desk to empty the till, and that's when I saw something on the counter. It was a VHS tape in a plastic container. The man must have returned it. Only, it wasn't one of ours. It had the same kind of clear plastic holder we used, but... It didn't have a sleeve or a jacket from our store. The tape inside it had a sticker on it with a name written on it. It said, Melissa, that's my name. The tape wasn't rewound. It was as far to the right as it could get, like it had been watched to the very end. My, my hands were shaking, but I managed to put the tape in the rewinder. It was an automatic reaction. I wasn't even sure I wanted to watch the tape. As it rewound, I argued with myself over what to do. I thought about not watching it, but knew it would eat away at me if I didn't. I thought about waiting for my boyfriend and watching it with him, but he was a hothead, and if it was something bad, 
I could see him going postal. I decided to watch it by myself in the back office. My finger had hovered over the play button, but eventually I pressed it. The tape started with static, then an image took over. It was a grainy handheld camera, held by someone in the driver's seat of a car that was moving. The holder of the camera was trying to keep it steady while they drove. After several seconds, the available hand turned the steering wheel, and I caught a glimpse of something out of the windshield that I recognized. It was the glowing sign above our store, South Coast Videos, in neon. I watched the car pull into the back end of the parking lot, right where the man had been going earlier. The camera pointed at the front entrance of the video store and waited. A family car entered the parking lot. My boyfriend. It pulled up in front of the store and I watched myself kiss him as I got in. The video cut to footage from a new day and another work drop-off, this time by my parents. It showed another and another over a dozen cuts of me getting out of the car and going into the store. Then the video showed me coming out, going into whichever car was picking me up that night and driving off. In the video, I recognized the pants I was wearing from the previous day and realized I was watching footage from last night. I watched myself get into my parents' car and drive away. This time, the camera followed. The driver was tailing us, and it stuck with us all the way home. I watched my parents' car pull into our driveway. The camera focused on our house, number 42, and then cut to black. For a moment I thought that was it, but the tape had more. A new image flickered on. It said it was just after 3 a.m. It was from inside the car again, and it was pointing at my house. The driver's side door opened and the camera got out. It moved across the street and towards the side of the house. The camera pointed in through the window along the side as it moved towards the backyard. I saw the living room, the dining room. They were both dark and empty. At the back door, there was a fumbling and jangling before a small metal tool was brought out and jammed into the lock. It was twisted and the door popped open. My heart went from beating a million times per second to not at all. The man was inside my house. The camera switched to the grainy night vision and moved through the empty kitchen. It entered the living room and looked at photos hanging on the walls and books stacked on the shelves. It took the whole room in. Then it turned to the staircase that led up to the bedroom. The camera moved up the stairs quietly and reached the second floor. I pressed stop on the VCR. I wasn't sure I wanted to continue. I reconsidered getting my boyfriend and asking him to watch and tell me what had happened. But, but I had to know. I pressed play. The tape began with the camera looking left, then right down the hallway. I knew that to the right was my younger brother and sister's room, and to the left was the bathroom, my parents' room, and mine at the far end. The camera started left, focusing on the door at the end of the hallway. My door. The camera moved past the bathroom and my parents' room without slowing. It came to stop on my door. A hand reached out and turned the knob. It opened a crack and a hand slipped in further, bringing the camera with it. My bedroom door closed with the man on the inside. The camera found my bed and there I was, sound asleep. My thumb hovered over the stop button on the VCR, ready to end whatever it was about to see before it traumatized me for life. The camera was placed on my desk, facing the bed. The man from the store came into view. He carried a rag in his hand. I watched him creep up onto the bed, easing himself across it until he was over the top of me. Then he pressed the rag down over my face. My body trembled and shook and then went still. I pressed stop and threw up in the garbage bin beside the TV. Watching the attack, I'd gotten a horrible, familiar feeling, like a forgotten memory reappearing after being lost. I took a few minutes, collecting myself, before deciding once again that 
whatever happened to me on that tape, I needed to know. I pressed play again, and there was the image of my unconscious body in my bed, being straddled by a black-clothed goth psychopath. The man pulled the rag away from my face. He pulled my shirt up over my head, then reached around to the back of his pants. He pulled out a knife with a ceremonial handle and dragged it down the center of my chest without drawing a drop of blood. Then he put the blade to the palm of his left hand and cut. He winced at the pain, but then resheathed the knife and dabbed his right finger and the blood of his palm. The man used the blood to draw all over my stomach and chest. He made strange markings on my skin, taking his time while he did so. Then he finished and lit a candle. He held it with his right hand and put his bloody left hand on my stomach. I could hear him on the tape, speaking quietly, but couldn't make out what he was saying. It sounded like hushed chanting or praying. As he went on, my back began to arch upward and lift off the bed. My mouth opened and I held one long continuous gasp for what felt like minutes. Then the man stopped, and so did my gasp. I fell limply back to the bed, and the candle blew out. After a moment, the man got up and cleaned the blood off my stomach, using a towel he'd brought. He grabbed the camera from the desk and crept out of my room. Everything went hazy after that. I'd sweated through all my clothes, my whole body trembling, but I still watched the camera sneak back out my house and to his car. The video pulled something back in my memories. A strange, frightening disturbance in the night. Only brief flashes and lengths and dismissed as a bad dream. But I had a horrible migraine when I woke up. It all made sense. I showed the video to my boyfriend and he freaked out. We called the police and gave them every bit of evidence there was. But the man was never found. That was years ago, and the only reason I'm thinking about it now is because I'm pregnant. There are strange markings appearing on my growing belly that look a lot like the ones the man drew in his own blood. I'd been watching Trailer Park Boys when my roommate Alex suddenly barged in through the front door, stumbling over himself as his neck craned to look behind him. I almost dropped my plate of oven-roasted chicken tenders, the Friday meal of kings. Jesus, Alex, what the hell? I yelled at him as I turned the TV off. I was pissed that he'd ruined my sublime couch potato meditation, something I'd been cultivating for the past couple of hours. He mumbled expletives, more to himself than to me, as he kicked the door shut, getting up from the floor. Now I was concerned. Alex wasn't the type of person that feared anything. I'd seen him throw hands with guys twice his size, and when the situation called for a fight or flight, he almost always fought. Dumb? Maybe. But scared? Never. Alex? You okay, buddy? I asked him, placing my tendies down on the coffee table, trying to figure out if it was a get-the-baseball-bad-or-call-the-cops type of situation. He turned around and zoomed past me towards the kitchen. He grabbed a chair and dragged it to the front door as he jammed it up under the doorknob. Who'd you piss off this time, I asked. Shh, he snapped as he gave me a concerned look. Turn the lights off, he whispered in a ragged breath. I walked to the switch, making sure not to make any loud noises, and flicked it. The apartment became completely dark. Are you going to tell me what the f- Shh! He snapped again, his eyes now turning towards the door. He stood in awkward silence for a few minutes. Finally, his shoulders dropped down, and he walked to the couch and sat down, letting out a low sigh as his tense body started to release itself from the adrenaline armor. I joined him, but I didn't say anything. It was on him to explain whatever was going on. Once he'd calmed down a few more breaths worth, he began to explain. First, if it sees you, don't flinch. It's smart like that. It knows what's prey, 
and it'll come after you. Or that's what I think, at least. What are you going on about? Who came after you? Did you pick a fight again? What? What? What came after me? Not who. Okay, so... What is coming after you, then? I don't know. I saw it in the woods. Just, like, sitting there, looking at me. And then I looked back, and... Sure, it was some kind of prank, or... Some neighbor kid, or something. Then it turned, like, upside down. And I flinched. And then it came at me. I, I, I ran here as, as, as quick as I could. Sitting so close to him on the couch, I could smell the liquor coming off of him. His scent intertwined with the eau de toilette of man sweat and cheap rum. Are you drunk? I'm, he said loudly, then glanced at the door and brought his voice down again. I'm not seeing things. This is real, Zack. It's not a joke. Alex was a hothead when he was sober, but booze basically made him a kiln that would melt steel beams. I needed to calm him down, approach the subject slowly. Even if it did ruin my night, he was my friend, right? Okay, I I'm sorry, I said, reeling back, distancing my emotions from the subject. Where were you? Just out by the trail, coming back from the bar. Okay, and what should we do? I don't know. At some point, I, I stopped looking back. It's so fast, like a cheetah or something. It moved. It was like a circus freak or a dancer or something. It didn't, it didn't move like humans or animals do. I, I don't even know how I outran it. He'd started to spiral. I'd seen this before. Whenever Alex got some idea in his head that he couldn't wrap his brain around, he couldn't just leave it. Instead, it swirled around in that thick head of his, scrambling up his mind, vignetting the world. Things of that nature would frustrate him to no end, and I still hadn't figured out a surefire technique to get him to reposition his attention, but I was going to try anyway. Well, we, we got the door secured. I don't hear anything outside, I told him, hoping to calm him down a little bit. You, you sure you didn't hear anything? I'm sure, man. Okay, yeah, Th thanks. <sighs> I need a drink, he said, hopping up from the couch and heading towards the kitchen. After some clattering, he emerged with a frosty bottle of Mexican beer. He turned the lights back on and bent down as he slammed the bottleneck on the edge of the coffee table, sending the metal cap flying across the room in an impressive arc, the work of a seasoned drunk. The bottle reached his lips just before the frothing bubbles began to spill over. He suckled on it like a pacifier, his throat making extraordinary loud gulps as he finished nearly half the beer in one swig. He groaned as he put the bottle down on the coffee table and burped loudly as he sat down. Just like that, he was back to his old self. You want to talk about it more? I asked pensively. Nah, man, I'm, I'm sure it's nothing. Sorry I got you all stressed out. That friggin' thing just it looks so weird, he replied, his face as blank as the TV. Yeah, must have been something really messed up. It's all right, I told him. No point dragging out things. Maybe tomorrow he'd want to talk. Want to watch TV or something? Alex didn't say anything. He just stared at the reflection on the black TV screen, his head facing directly forward, his arms limp beside him. Alex? TV? I pestered, but there was no reply. I looked towards where his gaze had sank to see if he was staring at something in particular. At first glance, there was nothing at all. Not even a fly buzzed on the wall. But then, movement from somewhere. For a second, all I could process was that something flickered, changed shape in what I was seeing. But I I was unable to piece together what it was. Then it clicked. It was on the TV screen, which reflected us sitting on the couch. Alex's head began to twist like it was a clock. Except, instead of hands, it was his mouth and eyes and nose that shifted around, turning and turning, 
pulling his skin and flesh as bones cracked and tendons snapped inside his head. Then he stopped, and where his mouth used to be, there were two bloodshot eyes. Where his eyes used to be, there was a mouth drooling spit and blood. I couldn't see or say whether he was smiling or smirking or frowning or all of the above. Something happens in the brain when things are upside down, making it harder to process the details. One thing was for sure, though. It was... It was looking at me. I was completely frozen. I, I could barely feel my legs, and my throat became as dry as a desert. All I wanted to do at that moment was finish off Alex's beer, but I didn't scream or run or throw punches. I just stared at it through the reflection, and it stared at me. After an eternity, the upside-down Alex got up from the couch and limped in front of the TV, blocking it with his body. Its eyes locked on me. And then it started to dance. But not like, like a real dance. More like an awkward jig. It limped left and right, jumped up and down, its face jiggling as the skin tried to contain its mangled contents. I didn't budge. Alex told me not to flinch. That's all I could think about, and the thought kept me occupied producing a mental barrier between me and whatever that wretched thing was. After a while, as a sort of last hurrah, I guess, the thing stopped its cursed jig, bent down, and put its face just a few inches away from mine, forcefully breaking my trance. I had to look at it, although it no longer looked at me in a natural sense, because its eyes were closed. Its mouth... It opened its mouth, revealing two eyeballs, still attached to that fleshy cord or something inside. They were held in place by gums, void of teeth, as small puddles of blood filled up the holes where they used to be. The pupils darted around erratically, still functional until they settled their gaze on my eyes. I swear I could see Alex in there, more scared than he had ever been. I felt bad for him, my buddy, my roommate, my, my friggin' friend, turning him into this thing. Then, gums locked down, squeezed the eyeballs into oblongs, till they finally popped like water balloons, spewing thick chunks all over my face. The urge to move was unbearable, and my own eyes burned as the liquid ooze fell over them. A moment later, the thing opened its mouth again. A muscular, fleshy globule began to slowly emerge from that mouth. It was round and wound in fibrous tendons, and from all its sides produced Alex's yellowed teeth, pointed in all directions, indented directly into the flesh. The fleshy blob was so large that the serrated, unkempt teeth scratched and pierced the edges of the mouth as it squeezed itself out, cutting open the lips until gravity finally took hold and it fell to the ground, making a clunky splatter as it collided with the hardwood floor. The thing's face was much smaller without it, anemic in tone. The thing leaned closer and opened one of its eyes. Out of it came the displaced tongue, still dirty and yellow from the rum Alex had drank. It inched closer and closer, until finally it started to lick the eyeball spew off my face. The tongue was warm and slippery, and it twisted around my eyes and my mouth as it licked off every last bit of eyeball left on my face. From somewhere inside the head, where the vocal cords are, I could hear pleasured groans, low and stuffy as they vibrated in between flesh and bone. When the thing finally backed away, I could feel a sticky film begin to coat my face as the spit began to dry. It tickled and irritated my skin, 
bothering me unimaginably hard. I needed to do something. I, I'd been stationary for too long, and all the nerves in my body were beginning to fight back with the stillness within. The thing faced me, its tongue sticking out limply from the limp eye socket. I don't know if, I don't know if it could still see me, as it no longer had eyes. I didn't dare flinch, but time was running out. A cramp, a twitch, a punch. Something was going to happen soon. Something needed to break the incubating stagnation. Promptly, the thing turned around and limped its way towards the window. Slowly and awkwardly, like it was losing control of the muscles and nerves within it, it opened it and jumped out. Our... Our apartment's on the eighth floor, so it took a considerable amount of freefall until I heard a wet thud. Even though it was gone, it took me a while until I felt safe enough to move again. When the cops and paramedics came, I tried to explain what had happened. I thought it must be at least somewhat believable. I mean, his face was proof. The way he looked, nothing natural could do that. They just blamed it on the fall, twisted my story to seem like he'd gotten into a drunken psychosis, his state of mind exclusively messed up, and jumped out the window head first, the impact smashing his face to look like that. They brushed off my story completely, condescending to me, saying that I was making a mockery of Alex's death, that I was probably high or drunk or both. But I know, I know that's not what happened. But that's all I really know, and it's not enough for much else. I can't fight this, I can't reason with it, and Alex is gone forever. I'm grateful for being alive, but I'm more scared than ever. I mean, the thing must have died with Alex, right? But what's been chewing at the back of my mind ever since is the fact that I never found that flesh tooth globule that the thing vomited out. The paramedics and the cops said that they found nothing either, which they mostly used as evidence to disprove my story. All I ever wanted was for my wife and I to live comfortably, but the longer we stayed together, the higher our bills became. We'd already fought off debt from college, barely scraping by. Even after we paid them off, we were only able to afford a tiny apartment on the outskirts of New York. Sidewalks laid cracked everywhere, while finely condemned buildings sat sadly against their crooked foundations. Crooked lamp posts that hang only by electrical wires. Graffiti marked every street corner, and bland art that existed without rhyme or reason. Homeless people could be found on every street corner, a constant reminder of what would happen to my wife and I if I failed to keep up with our payments. However, I managed to make somewhat decent money as a plumber, but even then, it sometimes wasn't enough to deal with the loan sharks, the hefty utility bills, the food prices, and gas money. I was willing to do anything to get us out of there. And that is where I encountered gambling. I was willing to take the risk. I'd take any chance to obtain a reward, even just a small one. It started out with a handful of poker games. Then I moved on to scratch tickets and slot machines. All I needed was enough to get by. Unfortunately, obtaining a payday from the casinos was impossible. I started growing desperate, which only led to more debt. The whole cycle sucked me down like Odysseus' ship into Charybdis' maw. Just like that, my relationship with my wife began to tear apart. My wife and I were once so close. Before we married, there would be days that we'd work together at the wood shop, creating 3D prints of various sci-fi characters in video games. Other times, we'd study the components of circuits and use them to create elaborate lighting displays whenever Christmas arrived. Our wedding day was supposed to be the greatest day of our lives. Instead of relying on the help of others, like we did back in college, we relied on ourselves. 
but my actions tore all that apart. I didn't know what else to do either. A few nights ago, I arrived at my apartment, having completed a 10-hour shift fixing drains of several upper-class tenements. I rested my hand on the knob, expecting the worst from my wife. Sighing, I pushed the door open. The moment I did, she was already in the front hall. Her eyes were scrunched, and she was holding a bank statement, smacking it for emphasis. Care to explain? she demanded. I rubbed my temples, removing my scum-covered overalls and plopping them right into the nearest laundry hamper. We locked eyes. Breaking eye contact with her would only ignite her anger further. She was holding another piece of evidence of my failure, my failure to strike it rich. All I could do was stand there sheepishly, tail tucked behind me, and wait to get ripped a new one. No words would come out of my mouth. She marched up to me, holding it in my face. Frank, you wasted $3,000 at the casino again, didn't you? My wife bellowed. I set my toolbox down and washed the pipe gunk off my hands, looking down for just a bit. Turn around and look me in the eye. Resting a hand on my eyes, I glanced over her petite frame. Then I began to speak. We can live comfortably if you just give enough of your excuses. We nearly lost our apartment twice from all the betting on the slots. You wasted our heating money on roulette. And now this. The landlord wants 4000 in two weeks. And if we can't get it sorted out, we're going to lose our apartment. I held up my hand reassuringly. Look, just let me figure this out. I'll think of some way to get money. You better, otherwise we're getting a divorce. You got it? Without another word, I put on a casual outfit and exited for some fresh air, shutting the door behind me. I gazed back at the unpolished apartment number on the frame. Wincing, I clenched a fist and descended the rickety stairs. Eventually, my boots hit the cracked pavement and I headed off. I stood outside a graffiti-covered subway station, pacing around, hands in my pockets. My fists constricted as I pounded a nearby wall. There's no way I could have been able to make that kind of money. Craps were too unpredictable, arcade machines were always rigged, and roulette was too high in stakes. Seeing red, I screamed and kicked a wall as hard as I could. My foot throbbed and... Once I was done with my fit, I broke down sobbing. The sidewalk darkened with my tears. I pressed my head against it, clawing at it until my fingernails turned crimson. Then, I felt a tap on my shoulder. Wiping my tears away, I glanced over. A card was lying on the floor. Its borders were covered in green dollar symbols. The rest of the card was a silver color, shiny enough to reflect my face in it. Written in gold letters were the following. Aces High Casino. Win one round of blackjack and earn $50 million. No monetary wager needed. Table 777. My eyes lit up. All I had to do was win one game of blackjack and I'd be rich. Dimples formed at the corners of my cheeks and I pumped my fist. I nearly clicked my heels in joy, but I decided against it. I'd already caused enough of a scene already, and I wanted to make sure nobody knew my secret. When I flipped it around, it had an address also written in gold letters. Despite the address being in an unknown area, I still managed to pull it up on my phone's maps and arrive without much struggle. The casino itself was a pigsty, to say the least. Smokers polluted the air and the prison gray interior. Slot machines with broken lights clicked and whirred while cheap dice clattered against tables with peeling felt. Meanwhile, the concrete floor was covered in colonies of roaches while neglected beer bottles sat against the rugs of several tables. The only thing that was well kept was the bar and a room draped with navy blue curtains and gold sashes. Emblazoned over the doorway was the number 777. This was the first time I'd entered a casino smiling. For once, I thought this was my lucky night. When I pushed the curtain away, they revealed a room with an ornamented black wallpaper, an assortment of oak desks, and other furniture. The walls were covered in fine Baroque paintings. On the floor was a single blue carpet covered in opulent tapestries. I followed the back wall to a single dealer table, 
coated in green felt. Two seats were present with one person taking the seat on the left. He was shaking with what I assumed then was excitement. Behind him was a dealer, a trim man with blonde hair and a top hat over his nose and eyes. He wore a dapper tuxedo free of blemishes that shimmered in the light of a single hanging gas lamp. His skin was pure, free of moles, glistening with a slight amount of glitter. Why, hello there, the man spoke, his voice slicker than the gel in his hair. Are you here to win big? Unlike the loan sharks, his teeth were cleaner than a freshly washed plate. Yup, deal me in, I said, straightening my back, shuffling into the last seat. The other player had his jaw locked together. His eyes were drooping and bloodshot. Sweat pooled around his brow like glass beads. Just like him, I always felt nervous about losing, so their reactions were understandable. You know the rules of blackjack. I deal out cards. You say, hit me if you want more cards. Get closest to 21 without going over. Dealer only draws two cards. And you can also surrender your cards for half your bet. When you don't want any more cards, say the word stand, the dealer said, shuffling his cards through his hands and manipulating them like a sculptor with a ceramic pot. I double blinked. Wager? What do I bet with? Play a game and I'll tell you. The mystery man focused on passing out the cards. First, he brought out two cards for himself and dealt two more to each player. Instantly, he flipped over his cards. Jack King, 20. I clutched the velvet black card, seeing what I was dealt. A 10 and a 7 of hearts. I forced my face into a neutral smile. My stomach twisted. There was no way I could get 21 that easily. Surrender, I said, pushing my cards to the dealer. All he did was shuffle the cards and toss me two more. They didn't even bother looking up at me during the process. The other players started clutching his stomach. His smile vanished. I carefully looked over the guy's cards. Seven and a two of clubs. Hit me, the guy on the left choked out. An ace of spades. Total of ten. Sweat trickled down his head like a shower in April. His eyes welled up with tears while foam developed in the corners of his mouth. I raised an eyebrow, wondering what his deal was. I knew the stakes of gambling, but my sixth sense was telling me something was just not right here. No, that couldn't be true. Even if there was some kind of string attached or fine print I didn't read, I couldn't risk giving up on that kind of money. Besides, this might have been my only chance to obtain such a vast reward without much risk. Hit me, the man wheezed. Five of hearts. His teeth chattered. While I waited for my turn, I stood up and walked around the room, getting a closer look at all the ornate gadgets and such. My eyes focused on a painting on the leftmost wall. It resembled a man in a rich military regalia, but something made my hair stand on end. His upturned white mustache looked damp, and his face sagged like they were crying. Linear, stick-like shadows were cast on the sleeves. Edging forward, they came into focus. Hands. I followed their form outward, which extended into oily, drepping arms. Shh! A faint noise echoed from somewhere in the room. What? I mouthed turning an ear to the source. Shh! It came from the painting. I backed away, hands at my side. Was someone dragged into that painting? Where are you going? You forgot to pay up, the dealer yelled back, hands slamming on the table and pulling out a sack of navy blue poker chips. I double took. I thought the card said that no monetary wager was needed. There isn't. Then I looked at the ground. There was a second rug on the ground. The tapestry matched, but its pattern didn't match with the other rug. It was off-center from the rest of the decorations, like someone didn't even bother setting it up properly. Taking a closer look, I could hear faint whispers coming from it, too. When I looked back up, the guy on the left was gone. I rushed over, checking his cards. A total of 
25. Swallowing saliva, I stood in confusion, wondering what to do next. I scraped my fingernails against my palm. I needed that money. If I didn't get it, I'd lose my wife and my apartment. And what about loan sharks? Only God knew what would happen to me if I didn't pay up. What was I going to do? What would happen if I lost? Would I turn into another object, just like the other guy? Or would it be a worse fate than that? That's because there isn't a monetary wager. I'm still taking half of what you owe. In my game, your payment is in pain. A sharp stab punched my left side. It felt heavier than before, like my veins were replaced with tungsten. I grabbed my fingers around my chest. The area around the pain almost felt like a tumor. Brushing around the area, I could make out a cylindrical mass. I tried to inspect it some more, but the pain overwhelmed me, and I crumpled to the ground. I crouched down on all fours, trying to get back to my seat, but the pain froze me in place. Reaching out a hand, I called out for help, but I got nothing. Slithering away, I pulled back the curtain to the entrance of the casino. I spat on the ground from the bludgeoning pain. Don't feel out of luck? You can still surrender once more and have two chances left. The dealer smiled, adjusting his hat. It was only a glimpse, but I caught a look at his upper face. His eyes were on his hat, and his forehead was blank. The dealer looked plucked straight out of an Alice in Wonderland book. What or who was this guy? Think long and hard about it. I saw you arguing with your wife. I clambered back to my seat. Still didn't know what the dealer did to me. Something in me forced me to get back up and keep playing. More questions ate at me the longer I played. How did, how did he know that information? Then I remembered feeling a tap on the back at Grand Central Station. The card that brought me here. He couldn't have been human. Was he some kind of demon? I didn't bother asking. There wasn't any way he would spill the beans about his nature anyway. After what seemed like hours, I managed to writhe back to my seat, slumping over the table like I just had the worst hangover. Ready to try again, the charming man said, resting his chin on his interlocking hands. Reluctantly, I gave him a thumbs up. He took back the cards and began manipulating the deck again. I analyzed every move he made. None of the cards were tricked. He wasn't second dealing, and he didn't have any aces up his sleeve, never revealing anything under the table either. His honesty was the only thing that brought me any reassurance. Still, keeping an eye out was critical. The dealer revealed his cards. Two tens again, one of spades and one of hearts. His face was harder than diamonds and glowing like one, too. Not a pleasing glow, but one that vex anyone that dared to glare at it. I looked at my cards, an ace and a seven, eighteen. Gripping my lower abdomen, I stayed crumpled in agony. The odds of getting a blackjack were slim, and stabbing pain skewed my thoughts. Surrender, I wheezed. The words slipped out of my mouth like a dying breath of a wounded soldier. The dealer smiled, holding a pile of blue poker chips around him. He waved his hand over the mound and made it an audible chant. Then they vanished. I held my hands over my face, bracing myself. Suddenly the pain doubled, shifting to my right like a mudslide down a hill. Now I knew everything the previous player was going through. I vomited out something hard and blue. It was a poker chip. Suddenly my guts turned and another seven spilled out. My esophagus wound itself into knots, more contorted than cobwebs. I forfeit. The man started to smile. Without these? With a thud, the hat-faced dealer pulled out a jar filled with a kidney and a piece of liver. They still oozed with blood that pumped and fit their containers. I remembered how the dealer said that there was no monetary wager. He never said there wasn't a wager at all, though. I paid in pain, and my wager was my organs. 
You want them back? Then win them. He set them back on the ground. Now there was no choice. My fate was sealed if I tried to leave. I started to shed tears. If I didn't get those organs back and fast, I was done for. Even if someone saw me passed out on the floor, finding donors for organs wasn't guaranteed. And even then, it had just put me further in debt. Nothing would be solved. Then again, was trying to beat this guy even worth it? No, the reward was too great. Taking a deep breath, I sat back down. Reluctantly, I asked that he proceed. The dealer drew out cards like before. He took the cards and gave them a good shuffle. Plucking two cards out of the stack, he revealed them. A king and a nine. Another poker chip tumbled up my throat. I spat it out, red and blue plastic heaping together. Not paying attention to the mess I made, he handed me two cards. A jack and a two. A twelve. Hit me. An ace. An ace could count as one or eleven, depending on what other cards were drawn. Still had a fighting chance. Hit me. A five. His dead stare tore at my soul. I scratched against the felt, the wounds on my finger reopening. From the corner of my eye, I could see him frowning. Are you going to play, or do you want all that money to go to waste? Shut up, I said through gritted teeth. Hit me. I watched the dealer play out the last card. A queen. You lose, the dealer said coldly, grabbing a pile of poker chips and holding them close. He waved his hands over the mound and made another incantation. Then they vanished once more. Everywhere at once, burning pain seared my skin, making me black out. When I woke up and felt my arms, they were covered in something hard and blue and plastic. My clothes were gone. I examined my extremities and my torso. My skin was missing, replaced with poker chips. They were shaped to fit every part. Cracks filled with blood gushed out with every slight movement I made. Horrified, I spilled my guts. More poker chips slid out of my throat. Piles of skin laid clumped to the side of the table in hideous pink and blood-red sheets. I think you know what's at stake now. One try left. You better make it count, unless you want to end up as an object for all eternity. The rigidity of my plastic-coated skin made every movement expose more and more cracks, searing my muscles. I groaned as I raised myself up. Crimson liquid dampened the table. I pounded at it. This was it. I either walked out of here with my money and saved my marriage, or I lost and suffered a fate worse than death. Giving up was not an option. I gave the mysterious man a death glare, not even bothered by his resistance. He plucked out two cards, a nine and a ten. This was my chance. Then my cards were revealed, a ten and a two. Fingers rattling, I took a deep breath and let the calmness seep into me. Hit me, I sputtered. Another two. Huffing, I opened my mouth to speak again. The dealer just stared at me, tilting his head like a vulture waiting for roadkill. The poker chips rattled again, grinding against each other. Hit. I paused for a moment, collecting my thoughts. At a value of 14, I needed at least a six to beat the dealer, but an eight or higher would result in disaster. Gulping down another chaser of saliva, I spoke. Hit me. To my chagrin, a five slipped out of the hand. I was now tied. Staring at the pile of skin and my other organs, I closed my eyes and shook in horror. An ace or a two were the only cards I could draw in order to win. I looked down at my cards, sweat dripping on the table. With a quick glance, I gazed at the eyes on the man's silk hat. Don't keep me waiting, the man demanded. I had begun to hyperventilate. His stare grew more intense the longer I waited. His confident smile turned into a frown of irritation. Eyebrows and mouth were twisted into a hideous snarl. He rattled his fingers against the dealer's table. The cacophony made my ears go numb. Then I whispered, Hit me. 
The man darted up, smiling back in anticipation. I'm sorry, what was that? I closed my eyes, expecting the worst. Hit me! I screamed at the top of my lungs. Then, the last card was revealed. A two. I had one. My mouth dropped open. The sheet of skin unfurled themselves and flattened over me. Two organ jars spilled over, their contents rising in a beam of white and torpedoing back into my body. Immediately, I yelped at the top of my lungs, clicking my heels and doing a little jig. I regained my strength, instantly looking around for traces of my prize. For several minutes, I wasn't able to uncover anything. Staring directly at the dealer's face, I asked him to reveal the prize. I don't have it with me, he said blankly. Not listening, I scrutinized every inch of the room, looking beyond his station, checking under the table everywhere. I searched everywhere for my prize, my happiness dissipating. With each step I took, my smile faded even further, twisting into a frown. My nose crinkled. Where's my 50 mil? I demanded, overturning the table ripping off the ornate paintings and yanking the tasseled rugs off the floor. You promised me 50 mil if I beat you. Do you realize what's going to happen to me if I don't get that money, you charlatan? The strange man just stood there, not even acknowledging my plea. You promised me money. You're a thief, I roared, pointing an accusing finger at him. I only did this for my wife, to save my marriage. I almost gave up my life trying to help my family out. You can't take that away from me. The demon stuck his hands behind his back and shook his head. He rolled his eyes back and thought something was up with him. You aren't like the other gamblers, he said. What other gamblers, I said, looking back. They all wanted the money for worthless things. A mansion with fountains and a view, hookers, a trip to Tahiti. He paced around me, his face rather relaxed and calm. Never once did he lose eye contact with me. But you had such determination to help your family that you would risk everything. I admire that. It took me a while, but I figured out that you're actually a kind-hearted person. I saw Red and tried to punch him. He grabbed my wrist, shoving it back. Listen to me. I understand your rage. There never was a prize in the first place. It was nothing but a lure to capture those that wasted their lives away. But there's one thing you don't understand. I thrust my hand back. I understand you nearly killed me for nothing. Yes, but that was before I saw you the way you really were. Listen to my words. Slowly I relaxed my posture, but I remained firm. Why should I listen to you? I can help you out of your situation. You owe me money, you snake. I said, my nostrils flaring. You never needed the money in the first place. Taken aback, I retreated. What do you mean, I said, my arms relaxed once more. You're a plumber, aren't you? I saw you come home from work. I also caught a look at your schedule. Forty hours a week for $38 an hour for five days a week. That's $36,000 a week for two weeks. You already have everything you need. But you don't understand. They need 4000 I pleaded. He wouldn't budge. Trying to earn this money via dumb risks and chance will not get you anything. Look at all the things you've done wrong. And I want to change that, I said, wiping my eyes as they began to tear. But what am I supposed to do now? The only way you can earn that money is through grit and spit, he said, walking around me. You aren't going to find solace through good luck alone and you already have the tools that some people don't. If you give up now, you might as well have lost. Think about it. With those last words, he raised his hand and snapped his fingers, disappearing without a trace. Slowly, I gathered my things and walked out of the casino, head hanging low. The next day, I was fixing an old lady's faucet, inspecting the leak. I wondered what the demon's words had meant. Before I stuck the wrench up to the U-trap, I remembered my pay. If I worked the same amount of hours as before, I'd only make $3,600.
but if I pulled off some overtime and worked several extra hours, I might just be able to pay off the debt. I started staying up much later than before. Not long after, my wife started becoming suspicious. Eventually, she confronted me. Frank, you've been staying up late. You going back to the casinos again? She asked, hands on her hips. I closed my eyes, and instead of fear, calmness filled my veins and my blood stilled. Not this time. I've been putting in some overtime. Her face loosened up for just a moment before hardening again. I held my hands up and motioned my palms downward. Listen, I've been horrible lately. All my gambling did was drown us deeper in debt. Her expression began to soften up again, her frown vanishing. I want to change things. We used to work so well together, doing everything to help each other. Instead of fighting against each other, it's time we made our peace, and we bring us out of debt together. I held my hand out for her to shake. She kept her arm pulled back and folded like a pincer of a mantis. Inch by inch, though, she extended it and took my hand. The following day, my wife convinced me to go to therapy and get out of my addiction, which I gladly obliged. Simultaneously, she decided to start up another job working as an electrician. Day by day passed, and we pooled our resources as one. Before our eyes, bills were paid, and debt disappeared faster than our eye floaters. Our financial status wasn't the only thing that changed. Her once crusty mood lightened up, and she began to smile more. She began to believe my words and began to respect the changes I made. And then we paid off our rent. We got a letter from our landlord saying that we now were even. The moment that letter came in, we embraced each other. The only question now was, what were we going to do with the extra money? Not long ago, we ended up earning enough to create our own 3D project, this time of a companion cube. Day after day, we create more projects. Although we weren't as happy as our days back in college, we still could make the best of what we had. In retrospect, the hat-faced man put up a good fight, but I managed to come out of the casino with more than I'd gone in with. It wasn't exactly money, but it wasn't worthless either. Things have been tough since Mom passed. Dad's a complete shell of himself, and I've been left on my own to sort through the abundance of emotions I've been going through. It was actually a relief when Dad told me he was going to head to the cabin for a week. Can you watch the place for me, Jared? He asked. Yeah, I had to watch the house, but that was no big deal. It's a two-story with an AC, stocked fridge, big screen, and a hot tub. It's not like it's a struggle, although the place does still have the landline for some reason. Before he left... Dad told me reception would be spotty at the cabin, per usual. If I really needed anything, I should call between 9 and 11 when he'd be out at the local bar. I told him not to worry about it, and I highly doubted I'd need him. If I couldn't reach him, I'd call Terry next door if I needed anything. Well, it didn't take long before I needed him. I was soaking in the hot tub when the lights on the back porch turned on. The lights back there are motion sensor. Silly me, I forgot to set the security system. What was the code again? As things stood, the alarm wouldn't go off if someone broke in. Thankfully, that animal or whatever it was had triggered the motion sensor, and it reminded me to do it. I'll call Dad and ask him the code. It was getting close to 11, so if I wanted to catch Dad, I needed to call him quick. My finger scrolled through until I found his name in the contacts. I hit call, and it began to ring. Suddenly, the landline did as well. The landline read, Jared's cell. I looked back at my cell. I've dialed Dad home, not Dad's cell. Jeez, silly me. I moved my finger to the red phone icon, but before I could pick it up, the landline stopped ringing. I hadn't hung up yet. Had it gone to voicemail? Confused, I raised my cell to my ear. No voicemail, only silence. Actually, I think I heard something. Is that static, or, or was that breathing? What the hell? My heart was pounding. I immediately hung up the phone. What the heck was going on here? Taking a deep breath, my heart rate began to slow. There was no way I heard breathing. That would, that would be ridiculous. Had to be a phone malfunction or something. I exhaled deeply and then began to laugh. What a way to start off a week alone, right? My cell began to ring. The ring caused my body to flinch. 
Clearly, I was still a little jittery. Who would be calling me at this hour? Looking at the phone, the call was from Dad home. My eyes widened. The phone continued to ring in my hand. In a panic, I, I hit decline. The backyard was illuminated by light once again. This was all happening so fast. Before I could react to the lights, my phone started ringing. Dad home was calling. Tears began to well in my eyes, and I hit answer. H Hello? I asked. There was no verbal response, but there was something. A slow inhale, followed by a slow exhale. My chest tightened. Hello? Hello? I repeated to myself. More breathing in return. Keeping the phone to my ear, I began moving towards the kitchen. Once there, I grabbed a large kitchen knife. I ducked behind the island, and the breathing on the other end ceased. I peeked my head out to survey my surroundings. The open and spacious nature of Dad's home came in handy here. The kitchen was about 15 by 15, with the island directly in the center and at the edge of the house. Peeking around the corner allowed me to see the entirety of the living room. It was a large, wide space directly in front of me. I leaned to the other side of the island to peek in the other direction. There were doors to the theater room, bathroom, and office. Down a little further was a little opening to the left. If you went in there, you'd see the front door and both flights of stairs. The office had two ways to get in, one directly visible from the kitchen and one around the corner in that opening. There were four landlines in the house, one in the kitchen, one in the office, one upstairs, and one in the basement. Ruling out the kitchen meant that this person was in one of three places. I sat behind the island. My body wouldn't stop shaking. I set down the phone and held the knife in both hands. If someone were here and coming for me, I was going to need more than a knife. I knew Dad kept a gun in the office safe, and I peeked around the corner again. The theater room, the bathroom, and the office door were all slightly creaked open. If I was going to protect myself, I needed to risk it. I inhaled deeply. As soon as I began to exhale, I shot to my feet and tiptoed for the office. Each step creaked slightly, and it was the only sound I could discern. Reaching the door, I wanted to pause for fear of what may be inside. I pointed the knife into the crease with my clammy hands and gently opened the door. The only light in the room came from the opening. Gently, I closed the door behind me and left it cracked slightly open as it was before. Crawling under Dad's desk, I reached for his safe. It wasn't there. Why wasn't it there? Where could it be? Ah, oh, crap. Before he left, Dad had told me he'd moved the safe to the basement. The walkout basement, with a door I'm almost certain I forgot to lock. Also, where another one of the landlines was. Then I heard movement. Someone was here. I sat on the knife so the light wouldn't reflect and curled into a ball. Outside the office, I could hear a fair amount of footsteps. Then the sound of a door swinging open. That was the theater room. Moments later, I heard a thud. Another door was flung open, this one closer. The bathroom. That was followed by another thud. That meant the office was next. Do I keep hiding, or do I make a run for it? I decided to run. As the sound neared the door and grew in intensity, I shot through the open door and exited the office, ducking around the corner. The other door to the office opened. Then there was silence. I held my breath, waiting for something, anything to happen. Seconds passed. Everything was still. Please, 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 slam the door so I can run. Still no sound. I could feel the little beads of sweat run down my forehead. Finally, I heard the other door slam shut, and I used the noise to disguise me running upstairs. Knowing where the intruder was had lessened my apprehension of going downstairs. I maintained quiet feet, but quickly maneuvered down the steps. As I reached the bottom, I saw that the walkout door was wide open. I didn't have time to worry about any of that. Darting towards the back, I found the safe and punched in the code. Wrong code, the safe beeped. I heard movement upstairs. You have to be kidding me. What was the code? I punched it in again. Wrong code. I could hear some sound upstairs. Whoever was up there was being much louder than they had been before. Frantically, I put the code in one more time. If it didn't work, I'd have to make a run for it. The safe door swung open. I grabbed the gun and hid. While hiding, I turned the safety off, then checked to see if it was loaded. Thankfully, it was. The creaking of floorboards could be heard overhead. Each sound grew nearer and nearer to the top of the stairs. I closed my eyes and tried to focus, steadying the gun. 
I aimed where the intruder would be and put the line aside on the stairs. The sounds grew increasingly louder. A figure appeared at the top of the stairs. Even in the dark, I could make out his all-black outfit and ski mask. One arm was raised, and it looked like he was casually massaging his neck. The figure hobbled awkwardly, each step looking more off-balance than the last. I waited until they reached the easiest spot for me to aim, and I fired the gun. A brief moment passed, and then the body came tumbling down the remaining stairs. Flicking on the lights, I kept my distance, gun pointed at the intruder. Red stains soaked the area beneath the man's body. Kicking at him a few times, there was no reaction from the limp form. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to flip him over. He was bleeding immensely from the neck. Removing the ski mask, I immediately became confused. The person was a complete stranger to me. Why would they break into my house? What was the purpose of doing this? What was the wound on his neck from? I'd fired the gun at the man, yet the wound wasn't a bullet hole. It looked like a slash. Looking over to the stairs, there was a hole in the wall. Had I missed? Then how did... It was then that the landline began to ring. It said, Jared's Cell. William Harrison's Preparatory School for Gifted Youngsters was a big school. A very big school. A very, very big and ginormous school. Yeah, that sounds better. If I had to compare it to anything, it would probably be Hogwarts. If Hogwarts, of course, were located in America and funded not by goblins, but by the social elites who sold their soul to the devil. That place really was the love child of Gothic and neoclassical architecture. It's four towers, like those of a mosque, reaching far up to the sky and looming over it. The only other thing I suppose you could look at and get the same vibe would be a tsunami. Excluding the main building, which had all the things you'd expect from a school, cafeteria, gymnasium, classroom, etc., you also had several dormitories nearby, which were basically low-key high-rise apartment complexes. Besides those, there were also several full-size stadiums for various sports, which, as far as I'm concerned, were more suited for pro athletes than a bunch of lazy high school kids. Don't even get me started on the horse stables. With all that in mind, I'm sure you get the idea of just how big this place was. And one day, during my first senior year, as I was eating my lunch alone as always, I remember wondering out loud, without having swallowed my sandwich, mind you, Man, who cleans this place? I'd already been a student here for about two years, and I'd seen some stuff that really should have decommissioned the place for good, ranging from health hazards, death, and property damage that should have only really been caused by dynamite. But I can assure you that whatever the hell destroyed the school's observatory sure wasn't dynamite. And yet, the very next day after any incident, at most two for the really severe ones, like the observatory, students would be allowed to come back to school and everything would be just like it had been before. Everything from the students who died to the buildings that had been damn near evaporated would be back as if nothing had ever happened. Not to mention messes that would have given body cleaning experts nausea would be taken care of. Easy peasy. I asked one of the teachers who was in charge of maintaining the school, assuming that the principal just, you know, had a lot of contracts with cleaners and contractors. But that teacher, as well as every other person I asked, said there was only a single individual who kept the school, the whole school clean, and in tip-top shape, Mr. Enoch. Now, obviously, I thought they were messing with me because there was no way any one man could clean a place as massive as William Harrison Preparatory School for gifted youngsters consistently and, most of all, regularly. But the more I thought about it, the less crazy it seemed. With all the other things I'd seen over the years, could one guy cleaning a really damn big place really be that far-fetched? After ghosts, demons, dimensional travel, serial killers, that one succubus, and everything else, 
Would one guy cleaning a big place really be where I'd draw the line? It was around March. March 24th, to be exact. To say that I had nothing better to do on that unassuming Wednesday would be an understatement. With the map Mrs. Scott had given me back during sophomore year, I had no trouble finding the janitor's closet. But I did frown when I saw that it was located at the very edge of the map. At the very edge of the school grounds, in fact. When lunch rolled around, I followed the map, making my way through the eerily empty grounds until the small dot on the map that represented me reached the spot labeled janitor's closet. I looked around, but saw nothing, even when gazing at the furthest end of the threshold of the wood from my left to my right, my scar that I got during junior year from those damn elves aching as I did so, I saw nothing. The map showed that I was right above the janitor's closet, and I don't know if it was intuition or experience, maybe both, but I looked down and stared real hard at the grass. That's when I noticed it. A hatch. A metallic, rusty, grass-covered hatch. My next period after lunch was a free one, so I think you, dear reader, will have no trouble guessing what I did next. Part of me felt relieved that it was far away from the main building, as the moan that the thing let out as I lifted it open could have burst eardrums unless you were out of sight. The other part of me, the small, rational, sane part, that had somehow survived after so long and after everything, protested vehemently, but I still went down there anyway. My phone's flashlight revealed a long, winding stairway that traveled deep below the earth, so deeply, in fact, that a dark fog that my light couldn't quite vanish hid the end. The derelict stairway creaked every time I shifted my weight a step further down, the sound amplified by the stagnant silence that hung everywhere in the air around me. I had no idea what to expect. At one point, I checked my map and saw that the layout had changed. The stained maroon interior had become a cool charcoal gray, but instead of showing the outline of my school and all the other buildings, it showed me long and winding tunnels. Think of a subway map, covered by spilled noodles. That, in effect, was what I was seeing. I continued on, and the stairway eventually devolved into a ladder. Upon reaching the bottom, I was greeted by six lonely tunnels, each holding aloft signs written in a language that could never come naturally to any human. Devil runes, as I had unfortunately come to learn from Isaac's writing. Squinting at my map, I was barely able to make out my destination, but once I found Janitor's room, a faint path illuminated. I followed it through one of the tunnels and made my way through the unwinding path, one infinitely more perplexed than any sewer system, a system that could have very easily belonged to Hayar, that underground part of the school dormitories which inspired Lovecraftian cities of Rylea. After a while, through good or bad luck, either as likely culpable as the other, I happened upon the door I'd been looking for all along. It looked so out of place that it actually fit. Plastered on that stained and weathered accented concrete was a quaint and antiquated wooden door, baby blue when it came to color and decidedly Victorian when it came to style. I could have done any number of things at that moment, but there was only one which came to mind and seemed appropriate given the circumstances. I knocked three times, waiting for the door to open. I heard a latch being unlocked, and the man I'd been searching for all this time peered out. Hello? A raspy voice, almost throwing up dust, spoke out, and I was somewhat taken aback by the figure who soon revealed itself to me. A tall, lanky, fairly disheveled old man stood beyond the threshold of the door and looked at me without a shred of animosity or annoyance. His eyes were weathered but kind, and the small badge that hung from his uniform read Mr. Enoch. Of the two of us, I'm sure he was warier of me than I was of him, but even so, the old janitor didn't hesitate for a moment in letting me in, 
after expressing my desire to enter. His room was, for lack of a better description, a windowless jail cell. The cellar reached high up like we were at the bottom of a fat well, and although spacious, I was also greeted by a bed, a table, a sofa, and countless books written by none other than Professor Francis himself. A single chair had been set up in front of the sofa, as though he'd been expecting me. The old man wobbled towards the sofa, and I couldn't help but feel sorry for him. He looked like he'd have a hard time holding a mop, let alone using it, and even more so to clean a place like William Harrison Preparatory School for gifted youngsters. After we'd seated ourselves, an uncomfortable silence took hold. I had no idea where to start, and Mr. Enoch seemed to be going through the very same problem. I, myself, became so focused on finding something to talk about that I was caught off guard when he said something. Are... are there any more trees left beyond the ones here? I stared at him, confused by what he was trying to get out of me. Thankfully, he understood my confusion and elaborated further. When I was younger, I read a science fiction story about how in the far future there would be no more trees, only concrete and metal. I haven't been out for a while, so has, has that happened yet? No, I told him bluntly, at, at least not yet. His mild grimace softened into a smile at my wit. After that, Mr. Enoch mostly asked questions about the outside world, and we had a nice chat. I feel somewhat guilty for not being able to precisely recall what it was that we talked about at the time, since I'm writing this now. I do remember, however, that after some time had passed, Mr. Enoch suddenly lifted his sleeve and stared at his vintage wristwatch that clung to his waning wrist. I apologize, but I'm afraid we have to cut our conversation short, he said quite suddenly. I looked at the time on my phone and saw that the school day was almost over. Mr. Enoch was nice enough to show me out, and for once, I wish I could have stayed longer at school. Talking to Mr. Enoch became a daily routine. I like to think that it was therapeutic for both of us. In our subsequent interactions, I'd mostly asked him about his past. From what he told me, Mr. Enoch had been the janitor for the school since the mid-1930s, and he'd gotten the job to support his family during the Great Depression. The money he earned was the only thing that kept them afloat. Even after the Depression passed, he continued to work at the school as a janitor, eventually moving in to live here. It was the only thing he was qualified to do, and the cash was better than almost any other job that he had had. He had seen strange things, he told me, much like I had, and there were other janitors who'd help him out, but after so long, he was the only one who'd stayed. Made it, was how he put it, and I couldn't help but understand. Anyway, as he got older, he found it increasingly difficult to do his job. It also certainly didn't help that he had to do everything alone by this point. He felt like Sisyphus, he told me, each day struggling and pushing against a boulder that put him at the threshold of his strength limits, only for it to roll back down again. When the 2008 economic crisis hit, he knew he'd be offed. For the first time, there were many people willing to take his job, and that coupled with him losing his house made him terrified of ending up on the street and in a world that he hadn't been in for decades. In short, he was willing to do anything to keep his position. Anything? the principal asked. Anything, I replied, and thanked him. And now, I have this job forever. He wouldn't elaborate any further on that. By the end of April, I'd told him all about the things I'd experienced, and he seemed saddened by what he called the thousand-yard ramble, where I'd explained everything in great detail, but gave the impression I wasn't talking to anyone in particular, like talking to a wall. Never made much sense to me back then, but I went along with it. Interesting, isn't it? Mr. Enoch once told me after finishing a long sip of tea, you'd think you'd 
have this whole place figured out by now. After all, that's what you've gone through, but there's still so much more, ain't there? You'll be gone soon enough, and the next fresh fish, one with a heart like yours, will still be able to see this much and much and much more. That honestly scares me more than anything. If everything I've gone through is just a drop in the bucket, then I don't ever want to think about the ocean floor and what it could possibly hold. These were the kinds of conversations we had. They really lifted a weight off my shoulders, you know? Made me feel like a human, and made me feel understood. Corny, I know, but what the hell, am I right? On some occasions, though, I'd find his presence unbearable. I saw myself in him. I saw where I never left this place. But then I'd wonder if it would be so bad. Scouts, Wendy's, Derek's, and others like me would always continue to come here. And with my experience, maybe I could save them. But Mr. Enoch's gaze would always curdle whatever I'd be thinking like that at the time, as if he knew what my mind was toiling at, before telling me not to think too much, for fear would rot my brain. Too much thinking is bad, he always tells me, and maybe there's a benefit to being ignorant to it all. Maybe if I'd been ignorant, the past would never haunt me. I think it was around late April when I decided to die. I didn't know how, just that it would happen before graduation. Something would come my way, and I wouldn't run like a coward. That's all I knew. The next few days were all a haze. Exams were on the horizon, but what the hell did I care? The days started to compress together like pancakes each day blurring into the next. Things had been peaceful. My mind didn't really like peaceful. As far as my mind was concerned, something was wrong. In essence, I found myself trapped in the coils of a reality that I wanted to desperately escape from. I wasn't going to attempt to take my life. I was merely waiting for it to end. Just like that, all the other things in life came to me when I least expected. On one day in particular, May the 9th, on Thursday, when my mom would be working until early the next morning, and I was supposed to return by bus, I dozed off after my last class, and by the time I woke up, only moonlight shone through the windows. This wasn't the first time I'd been in the place after dark, far from it, but this was the first time that I was here past midnight. The monolithic saying inscribed last in Adam's last testament I'd found with Mrs. Scott that time in junior year reverberated in my skull as though I was just reading it for the first time all over again. Abandon hope, all ye who last past midnight. And I felt that this was it. It would be waiting outside the classroom, the thing that would finally give me the peace I wanted, the peace that I deserved. The light of the moon oozed through the sealed window, stretching my shadow thin like the sun. My mind was counting every second, my ears ignorant to each step I took, even though I myself was not aware of it. I walked down the long, ever-winding, ever-changing hallways, led not by Mrs. Scout's map, but by my shadow, the bowsprit that led me forward. Eventually, my shadow clashed against the shadows of something else, two ships colliding with each other. I'd finally met them, the one who I knew would give me the peace I wanted. I looked up, thirty seconds till midnight. What, what are you doing here? I admit that despite him being that old, hearing Mr. Enoch's voice tremble as much as it did was something that caught me off guard. You're always alone, I'd told him. 22 seconds till midnight. Even now I can feel them, like a metronome bashing the inside of my skull. It's a terrible feeling. Believe me, others have always come to my aid, but it's about time I return the favor. 12 seconds till midnight. N no, was all my friend could say before he collapsed to the ground. 
10 seconds till midnight. Mr. Enoch writhed as though he was the rope in a tug of war between a seizure and an orgasm. You don't understand. It's not too late. G get out of here. I, I can't hold it. These and many others are the words I thought Mr. Enoch would have told me were he not in the middle of his midnight metamorphosis, the one I'd sensed. With every tick, his bones cracked, his flesh seared and squirmed, his mind fragmented. But not once between any of them did he let out a scream. Midnight finally fell like a curtain. One last tick, and it came. Hundreds of leeches seemed to erupt out of the poor old janitor, each the size of a horsefly, gushing forth towards me like a Yellowstone geyser. Forty yards became thirty, thirty became twenty, twenty became ten. The wave approached like a slithering snake, and one could outrun it if they were fast enough, and if they started running before the thing picked up steam. But I stood still. It was only when the wave was about to cross the five-yard threshold that someone tugged my arm with unprecedented strength. I found myself running, the avalanche behind me picking up pace like a snowball, rolling down from Everest's summit. Mrs. Scout? I wasn't being pulled. Rather, I was chasing the past. I could hear her steps, muffled as they were by the ear-caressing squelching sound that followed me. I lost track of her, but when I noticed a wave of ashen hair disappear behind a corner, I followed it. Desperately, I wanted to catch up with Wendy, to, to apologize. The more I ran, the more I felt like I was chasing darkness, something that I'd always carried in my shadow, but never been able to reach. I found myself surrounded by lockers. The wave was approaching from both sides, and I knew that... It wanted to sink its countless vile teeth into me and leave nothing behind. I closed my eyes and felt the strongest grip yet yank me to my feet and shove me into a locker. The door slammed and through the cracks I saw Derek, his face contorted into one of rigid grimness. We're fine with being stuck here, he said, but not with you joining us. He ran in the direction I had and a large looming shadow left me in darkness. The countless, ever-sprawling maggots didn't dare invade the privacy of the locker. They seemed to shriek like a crowd jeering because I had gotten away. It was so dark, I only remember waking up. Mr. Enoch had opened the locker and held me tightly, glad to see I was alive. You see that? He said, Burial able to contain the first genuine emotion he'd felt in a long time. You're not alone, and you never will be. Not here, not outside either. I took a bus home in awe and shock. The whole ride, I just tried my best to focus my attention on the blooming sunrise. I found my mother asleep. She'd collapsed on the couch the moment she'd returned, which, I guess, worked in my favor. Not that long has passed since then. Story's over. I get it's odd, especially after my last one. First comes the beginning, then I give you an end of sorts. This isn't like me. I bet you'd be disappointed with the pessimistic tone I've written this in. You don't know anything, though, do you? So many things I haven't elaborated on. Hell, things I haven't even mentioned yet, but which I will, in time. The lid of Pandora's box has been opened, thanks to you, Mr. Enoch. I'll tell someone else's story next time, those who were consumed before they had a chance to do so themselves. God knows that's the only reason I'm still alive and kicking anyway. All thanks to you.